guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm here to share quite a belated for me um, monthly wrap up for May. <laughs> I was just like thinking, what month even was it? Um, I didn't do that much reading in May. I mean, I read a good amount, like 10 books, I think. Um, it was definitely my like most stressful and hardest month in terms of trying to finish for university and like dealing with new treatment plans and da 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 da, da. but um, I like picked up a lot of books I didn't finish but I didn't, they're not necessarily DNFs they're just books that I'm working on and I wasn't in the headspace to read and I didn't feel like I was giving them my full commitment so I've just sort of like put those to the side and I will definitely be picking them up this month or next month when I have so much more free brain space than I could ever wish for um knowing that I have completed university and can think and breathe things that aren't children's education for a few months um so that's exciting but anyway i will get to the books i read and in no particular order so of women and salt by gabriella garcia i absolutely loved this if you are a fan of um reading stories related to the u.s last america to u.s u.s immigration experiences then i can highly recommend this one to add to your roster if you enjoyed infinite country dominicana those kinds of women-led stories about the often neglected experiences that are specific to gender when we talk about uh, migration and this story definitely centers on the idea of motherhood and being mothered how you can um be mothered and also be a bad mother yourself or where we draw those lines in the gray areas of motherhood it's about three generations of cuban american women and that we flip between the stories of the 1800s a cuban cigar factory the use of la miserable as a tool for the inspiration of communist workforce and then we move to present day miami and look at sort of backgrounded is the opioid crisis drug addiction and then um immigration deportation ice all those kinds of like american services that are um unfortunately part of the lives of people who arrive in the us and aren't born there um it's definitely a harrowing read in places i would say um and it's a slim novel it's a lot slimmer than i thought it would be like i bought this in person and picked it up and thought oh i was really expecting this to be like a, a good few hundred pages but i think in such a slight book um garcia still manages to tell these stories with grace with um with a protective sort of um quality to them she's not um it's not a tell all she's not expressing or fabricating trauma i think it is a hard book to read and it does talk a lot about some really heavy and distressing topics but that's not to say those should be shied away in literature there's no i hate this morality about books this idea that by talking about these things we are exploiting them like this is a real life experience for a lot of people and i think garcia goes really good way and an honest account of the experiences of these women it looks a lot of colorism and this, there's a lot of introspection from these potentially morally gray characters on occasion and the proximity to whiteness and the experiences of cuban women that differentiate between other latin american women i really liked that um specific experience that she was leaning into there um because of this Cuba's history as well as their sort of like the rush of migration they had um, for women and how in the families they look at uh, family members who came to the US in the first wave versus the second wave and I think that was really interesting the way that um, she explored the community and sort of added to the idea that there is no monolithic refugee or story to America because each of the families that are involved are individual um, and I don't think it's worthwhile trying to put them all into one box. I only name those other books because I think it's useful if you know what kind of books you like. That's, you know, potentially a lazy comparison on my part. But um, I thought the the slim nature was was beneficial because it didn't spoon feed the reader, particularly a white Western reader. Um, it required you to fill in the dots and understand a lot of Cuban history in order to interpret the book. And I thought that that was really useful. So that's my thoughts on of Women in Salt. So I feel very scatterbrained still. I'm not even sure if that made sense. Then a book I DNF'd. I always think it's interesting to include these. Um, the Consequences of Love by Gavandra Hodge. This was a memoir my mum put in my stocking. I want to say like two years ago. So it's, a, it, it's an odd, sort of not odd, but like an unusual premise. So um, Gavandra's mother um, and father grew up in London, in Chelsea. Her 
father's quite a successful hairdresser but on the side is a prolific drug dealer to the high society in the 70s and the 80s and they have a daughter um, alongside Gavanja Candy who dies really suddenly in a um, like holiday sort of like freak like freak, freak illness essentially um, and we sort of then go from the experience of her dying on holiday to how her parents start to cope with it and fall back into drug addiction but I don't know I also listened to this on audio while reading it and I think the audio really put me off um the accent of the narrator who I believe is Gavanja which I don't know that this was mean to say but like her accent was so um inflected with privilege that I found it really hard to talk about um to read about her you know the the exceptionalist of her father even though he was a drug addict and was a drug dealer as well um not necessarily that an addict makes him a bad person but just sort of the way that she was like oh but he wasn't like other dealers or he wasn't like this and he wasn't like that and I just kept thinking like this is all because of your your family's whiteness that this is happening and I found that really hard to sort of come to terms with um she talks also a lot about her life working at Tatler which if you live in the UK I don't know if Tatler's thing in the US it's like a very high society like magazine that I have absolutely no interest in so yeah that was a DNF for me I'll probably take it as a charity shop I'm sure probably has some interesting stories in it it just wasn't my kind of thing um then i read a couple of brilliant pr brilliant proofs from canon gate which you would have seen if you're signed up to my newsletter plug if you're not signed up to my newsletter i talk about the books i'm reading as i'm reading them as well as my life and illness and other extended pieces of writing so in there i raved about the startup wife by tamima and nam i absolutely love this this is out on the 3rd of june so this just came out already but i think what took me by surprise is i picked this up in a like a period of high stress when i was getting ready to finish assignments for university and I was expecting this to be a sort of you know bubble wrapped light-hearted love story maybe a commentary lightly on the patriarchy and tech industry but this was really took me by surprise so the premise is that um Asha is doing a PhD looking at like the intelligence emotional intelligence of the brain and then she has like a very much like meet cute love at first sight encounter with someone that she went to high school with and they end up in this well in romance and he's really interested in religion and in like a new formation of non-organized religion using tech um and it's not necessarily about ai it definitely veers into the sort of tech the nitty-gritty of tech and running this platform that's essentially like banding together people over shared rituals and this idea of community um and it's just so interesting the most unique concept in a like tech book that i've read in a while um and I think that's why I enjoyed it so much because it really took me by surprise the the philosophical elements of it and the things it left me thinking about when it comes to religion and also male chauvinism and this idea of the male that we must be w most wary of is the male who parades them showboats and parades as the most progressive in like liberal spaces also comments on colorism and how experiences a brown woman in tech as well as just a woman in tech and I really enjoyed that as well I often find tech narratives really dull but for some reason I think imbued with the ideas of feminism and religion it all really came together for me um I thought it was it's a really clever line to toe when you're talking about complex intellectual ideas through a very sort of plain text i think that's super super clever and almost more i find that more intriguing than reading a just straight up like extremely literary take on a meta idea um i feel like a lot of people will enjoy this they'll pick it up thinking it's like a romp silicon valley sort of vibe and then we'll maybe get even more from it um so i really like that i think she's making so many statements in here about like religion and atheism and secularism and also like end of the world and this is the first book i've read where a fiction book where the coronavirus is featured as part of the plot line but it is not the plot line and that last 20 pages really just like took it to another level for me because i thought she incorporated that idea not even an idea that life we all lived in a really clever way and the way it was very believable in the way that people reacted in the tech industry when so many of them worked for this these startups that believed the end of the world was eventually coming i don't know if that's making much sense but yeah this is definitely one to look out for um as it's being released um at the moment 
Then another proof I got from Canon Gate, a book that's not out till August, is Small Bodies of Water by Nina Minion Powers. I vlogged about reading Nina Minion Powers because I also read Tiny Moons, which is on loan to friends, and I imagine it's going to go round and round and round my group of friends because I loved Tiny Moons so much. Maybe I should talk about that first. So that's a collection of short essays interspersed with illustrations. It's published by an indie press, Emma Press, and it's Nina's first uh, non-fiction. She's written poetry before and it was just absolutely beautiful so it's essentially the premise is her year in Shanghai learning Mandarin and connecting with part of her heritage she grew up in New Zealand but has um Chinese heritage and it's a lot about um homesickness and geographical place in relation to sort of like the home your body feels in a place um and it's a lot about food and what we can draw from food in terms of creating meaningful relationships with people or memory and what we associate food with and it was just firstly hunger inducing if you're a dumpling guy who's a noodle person then you have to read this and then it was also just a really interesting look at like temporal spaces and how we navigate cities on our own as young women and she talks about her life as a woman of color in those spaces and being an outsider in a place where you should feel like part of the, the um majority and I really loved that and I thought I could have read like 50 more pages on it to be honest it's a very like evocative like sensual book when it comes to um provoking those five senses smells feelings the way she describes sunsets is all very like visceral and then her second book which is coming out in august the 5th of august yeah is published by Canningate, and that's a set of essays as the title small bodies of water it's about water swimming i love swimming she loves swimming we, we both like swimming um and it's about each essay is sort of set out as um, either a different experience that she's had swimming, whether that's in New Zealand, in London, in different places that she's visited. Also, like there's a lot of cross-referencing between her year in Shanghai, which I really enjoyed. Um, but she talks a lot about, I'm not sure, just like the minutia of life. And it's all sort of circling around the idea of water and a lot about food. But... She touches on a lot of different things. Some of my favourite essays were Me and Satsuki, which is all about um, how much she loves the um, Studio Ghibli films, in particular My Neighbour Totoro and the representation of water in My Neighbour Totoro, which I just think is absolutely fantastic. If anyone has read any more non-fiction around like, the themes in Studio Ghibli films, please hit me up, because she also talks about Ponyo, which is my favourite Studio Ghibli film, um, and sort of how that has a place in her heart, which I absolutely adored. Um, so she says, I really like this, um, where she talks about the perceived experiences of romanticising something, and it's only possible to romanticise rain if, like me, you did not grow up in a region prone to flooding. If I visited Koto Kimbalua, she has family in Malaysia, and particularly in Borneo, so she talks a lot about those experiences, but I've never experienced the flood. Through May and June 2020, the flooding led to a thousand people being evacuated. And then she references a lot of other writers, which I found really interesting, and like more books to add to my list. So she says, Australian writer Elena Savage, which is the author of Blueberry, states that low income women and girls are much more likely to drown in in flood regions because swimming education is not a neutral thing and I just think like it just really got my mind buzzing on loads of different ideas about language about belonging about place about gender um and I just really adored it I think a lot of people get a lot about that a lot out of this if you're fans of yeah any contemporary essay collections basically she also has the essay in here on chronic pain and just like undiagnosed pain she doesn't really speak I guess like in the specifics but she talks about pain as colors and i really liked that um metaphor she used i'm tired of my own voice do you ever get that okay let's whiz through a couple of audiobooks so i listened to the wreckage of my presence by casey wilson i won't go into that too much because i vlogged about it although on daniel and grace's recommendation i will be watching happy endings this summer so i hope i enjoy it that's the sitcom that casey wilson is known for i really liked her reflections on grief on mothering on um life in LA versus the places that she grew up and the the um, experience of losing someone suddenly and the hole that it leaves in your life but in dispersed with that it's funny stories about family dogs about the story about meeting her husband is beautiful and the, all her relationship advice I found really earnest in like in the best way and I just for I think an essay collection a personal essay collection that's very specific to someone's life that um, entices you the reader without you knowing who they are or being like a fan of them I think is 
is such a mark of how good the essay collection can be because I knew nothing about Katie Wilson I just liked the cover and thought I need something light-hearted and I went for it and it was again similar to Startup Wife that perfect mix of like intellectual meta um life issue commentary as well as funny and wry and sharp and I just adored it read a lot of essay collections this month actually looking at it um, then I read but actually mostly listened to A Life's Work by Rachel Cusk so this is her memoir of early motherhood it was written in 2001 it's very much like a capsule of the time although I don't think it has aged that badly in comparison to a lot of other books as particularly by female writers on female experiences that would have come out at similar times um, she obviously does um, fall into the trap of a lot of like binary language and talking about um, motherhood not parenthood and um, particularly the the pressures of cis white women um, and you know I imagine when this was published this was alongside a lot of other books that cis white women were writing about motherhood and like fortunately now we've moved past that and there's a lot of other stories about different ways of mothering that we can hear about which I very much appreciate so if this like if that's not your thing to hear about if you feel like you've read that story before then maybe I would give it a miss I mean it's extremely beautifully written and incredibly sharp she talks a lot about like nothing necessarily new that I haven't heard about motherhood before but she really interrogates her own personal experience and talks also in the foreword about how when she started writing about motherhood how much um stigma and you know people saying that she, she, like awful messages she received about not having children or she's a horrible mother her children should be taken away from her just from saying that she wanted to go out and hang out with her friends so like at the time it seems like maybe it was a seminal piece of work although the idea she's talking about now is not that controversial to say that you want to have a drink and see your friends after you have a child but um nonetheless I think it's aged pretty well I think I'm definitely more of a fan of her non-fiction than the fiction that I've dabbled in but I'm prepared to give second place a go if I can get it like ebook or cheap I'm not gonna I'm gonna fork out for that hardback baby um so yeah that was that one and then I read which you also saw me vlog about Molly McCullum Brown's Place I've Taken My Body this is a brilliant brilliant essay collection with disabled representation Molly lives with cerebral palsy and it's her experiences of uh, mobility body owning a body that's disabled experiencing sickness um although Molly and mine's um lived experience of disability is very different I could relate to a lot of her um stories of pain I found really connected to the way she discussed chronic pain and the pain scale and how we are gaslit by doctors and how we spend so much time trying to mask ourselves and our pain for the to placate other people I really enjoyed that so she also then dives like takes some tangents which is maybe not the most like tightly knit um thematically but I really enjoyed that so she talks about her upbringing with academic parents but in the bible belt and how she lived very close to an evangelical college um as a child but her parents were very much into books and science and then she talks about her dabblings in catholicism she interviews um one of the teachers at liberty college which if you guys saw my what's in my sub box you know i'm obsessed with fundy fridays and she did she's done a lot of content around liberty college um which is like a huge private fundamental christian academy college university in the states um and i really enjoyed those bits about um her experiencing religion and the difference between truth and science and religion and theology and why she feels like an imposter in both communities and um being disabled and being religious and how you are often like um fundamental christians or people of any religion will are often perpetrators of um ableism and this idea that they can heal you through christ and all these like terrible let me lay my hands on you types of situations which molly talks about in a really light-hearted and funny way although she emphasizes how horrendous and traumatic that can be um for disabled people especially if you're visibly disabled in a wheelchair or something and someone asked if they can pray for you and things like that which i mean you know that's a whole other video in there but i thought that was really interesting the way she looks at her own personal afflictions and contradictions with religion and disability and that's an intersect I have never read about and I'm sure a lot of you may have not either so that was one I would love everyone to pick up also it is a beautiful edition by Faber I was also kindly sent that for review um what other audiobooks I listened to now I'm not even remembering oh yes North Korea confidential private markets fashion trends prison camps dissenters and defectors you know me I love a good obscure or 
macabre look at a country that I have no interest or personal connection to and of course North Korea is a common one that lots of people in the West find as like this enigma country but this is the most updated book I've read on North Korea and also the most um the, the least personal I guess and the most broad in its um look at every different element of the country as the title suggests the way they dress the way they get their hair cut the way prison works the way um private trading works and it's a really like up up to date look at North Korea operating in this quasi capital position where private trading is going on and there is definitely a social hierarchy that is related to capitalism and business and how that interacts with communist beliefs and how it interacts then with further trade deals between other countries and I thought that was all super super interesting and this idea that like capitalism hasn't escaped like maybe one percent of the entire world and I really um appreciated that look at it and the presentation of it not in that tired same sense of a failed communist nation but more like how they're adapting and changing and what the experiences of people there um in relation to the experiences of people in other western late capitalism countries so yeah would recommend that if you have an interest i guess in north korea understand maybe niche <laughs> um and then the other book i listened to on audio which was rare for me to listen to fiction on audio as we know and i listened to the subtweet by Vivek Shara. Um, Vivek is a trans woman living in Canada, and I don't think this is necessary auto fiction, although she does have experience of being in a band and making music and participating in uh, like that industry as a brown trans woman. Um, I listened to this on audio when I was really unwell in a flare, and it's like the perfect kind of low key audio listen, but actually says some really interesting things. I mean, it's essentially a story about um, the music industry coming of age and finding your identity in um, sort of like those early 20s friendships and relationships and how that interacts with like personal and professional boundaries and the use of social media. It's very heavy on the social media, as you can see from the title of the subtweet. Um, so if that's not your thing, or you find it quite cringy, which I did in places, then I would just stick it all together because it's not your kind of book. It's definitely for people who like Taylor Jenkins read or those more sort of like hyper contemporary you know sort of books that are very much like in the now colloquial language um relaxed tone of voice those sorts of things but I actually had a really good time with it I thought it said some really interesting things about um sort of female friendship and how we navigate those spaces and forgiveness and those kinds of ideas of like almost like it wasn't like shoving the morality aspect down your throat and it definitely wasn't trying to teach you some really profound message about how girls should all look out for each other because I find that all very trite but um yeah I don't know I didn't really have much to say on it it wasn't like a book I read with an extremely critical eye do you ever guys ever feel like that like there's some books that I want to drink in every ounce of and think about in loads of different ways and other books I read particularly the books I pick up when I'm at my illest I'm just reading it to pass the time and that's not to say it's not a good book it's just I don't have that much to say about it because of the circumstances in which I read it does that make sense hopefully okay and the last book I read was um Women Talking by Miriam Tao so this is a fictitious retelling of a real life event I would say it definitely blurs the lines between fiction non-fiction faction that's what we sometimes call it when we explain it to children don't even know, know that's a real thing outside of schools but this says so between 2005 and 2009 a remote Mennonite colony a hundred girls were raped but they were told it was by ghosts and demons and in fact it was a group of men in their colony um so Mennonites are a form of non-conformist Christians I believe um this image on the front sort of depicts they are often mistaken or conflated with the Amish communities. Um, the women always like cover their hair and it's a very patriarchal set of beliefs and um, the hierarchy of the church and the, this particular very conservative colony was um, yeah, extremely top down sort of situation. And this entire book takes place over basically two, like a night and a day. And it's, as I suggest, women talking, it's a covert meeting between all of the women who were affected by this um act of ongoing violence and they meet to decide whether they should leave or stay in the colony so you're hearing about the events in past time because right we are situated in the barn in the roof having this conversation 
So we switch between stories of things that have happened versus, you know, someone over there doing knitting, the pregnant, um, one of the pregnant wives who's being sick and then flashing between these two tenses I found really interesting is definitely a, a denser way to write a narrative and I can understand it could be frustrating for some people to read because it feels like they're really going in on every single piece of minutiae in present time as well as telling us every piece of minutiae of the events that have happened in the past but I think it's a really interesting look at gender within a religious group and the ideas of autonomy with women and also how monolithic gender can be assumed by men in patriarchal situations because they're very much viewed as the women and also because they are doing this meeting covertly they are assumed to be transgressing the rules but they feel okay with that and some of them feel more okay with that than others and then there's also these questions of when they want deciding whether or not to leave how do they designate between the bad men and the good men and they have people in here who are intellectually disabled they have young boys and they're like do we take them with us but they're still boys they're still men they still could have done wrong they would have been indoctrinated into a um set of ideals that they would have then done wrong in the future if we hadn't found out about this now and i think that whole moral dilemma looking at um the ethics of um gender segregation i guess i thought was really really interesting um so yeah loved loved it um and would recommend it maybe with the caveat that it's definitely not for everyone because of the style um but yeah that's all i read in may wow my brain today guys is not working but i'm gonna go for a swim catch the rest of the sunshine and i'll see you next week for another video bye